Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for what is sure to be a very rich discussion. My name is Jenny McDonald. I am the marketing coordinator here at Cody Institute. And before we get into today's events, I'd like to first acknowledge the land that I and many of us here at Cody are joining you from today. Cody Institute and St. Francis Xavier University stands on the lands of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded home of the Mi'kmaq. We express our deep gratitude and appreciation to the generations of Mi'kmaq who since time immemorial have loved and stewarded these lands and the beings who call them home. Colonization is not just history, it exists in the present tense. While we strive to decolonize ourselves and our university, we know there is still much for us to learn. We are committed to doing the hard work of self-reflection and to repairing the relationships with the Mi'kmaq whose lands, on whose lands we reside, including embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to, calls to action and embodying their spirit in our plans to move forward with our university. We are all treaty people. Tomorrow, March 8th, is International Women's Day. It's a global day to recognize and celebrate women's and girls' social, economic, cultural, and political achievements. It's a time to raise awareness of the progress made towards achieving gender equality. It is an opportunity to learn, reflect, and advocate as there is still so much more to be done. Before I introduce you to our fabulous panelists, I'd like to invite Eileen Alma, the Interim Executive Director of Cody Institute to say a few words. Eileen. Thank you so much, Jenny. Welcome everyone. And I'm very pleased to see so many familiar names joining us today online, as well as many others who are perhaps new to Cody Institute. And you know, I'm recognizing that we have actually a, a, a great deal of uh, a great number of participants on our call today. And I know the challenge that we have using uh, you know these kinds of online arrangements and, and webinars. All of us are are I think go back and forth to you know in terms of our love of Zoom, especially after the last few years. But what's been amazing is our ability to connect with people all over the world all at the same time. So I'm seeing people coming as far away as, um, as Haiti, um, uh, far into Southeast Asia, all across Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as he, right here um, at home in, in Anaganish and Mi'kmaq. Um, so welcome to everybody. It's been 12 years now since Cody Institute established the International Center for Women's Leadership prioritizing space for community leaders identifying as women to come together to share their expertise and their experiences, support their learning and growth as leaders, and to strategize on how we can continue to advocate for gender justice and equity for all. Since then, more than 2,500 women have benefited from our programs, and in turn, Cody Institute and our team has also been transformed by the learning we have received, and we stand in solidarity with women leaders pushing for change everywhere. Hashtag embrace equity is the theme of this year's International Women's Day. And the question often asked is, why do we still need this? Why do we still need an International Women's Day? The World Economics 2022 report makes it clear. After all this time, it will still take 132 years on average across the world to reach full parity. And even more challenging, we still don't know how badly the COVID-19 pandemic will set us back in closing that gender gap. Prior to the pandemic, according to the report, we were set to close within 100 years. Women's rights continue to be stripped back on the whim of a few. Women continue to be sidelined in decision-making roles. They continue to be subject of all forms of gender-based violence, including as weapons and casualties of conflict. So imagine, 132 years before your daughters, your granddaughters, your great granddaughters will be considered equal to men and boys and consider the additional gaps faced by those with different race, gender, gender, caste, class abilities who don't conform to heteronormative privileged groups. So our collective action must continue and this is a small way to do so, to continue to honor women uh, of all backgrounds um, each year. 
What is the world that we wish to leave for our descendants? Gender equity benefits everyone and health and well being for all. So, our three guests today are amazing persons. They're humbly creating space for change, for peace, for justice, and for ensuring the rights of those who are often marginalized by our societies. It's an honor every day here at Cody to work with community leaders like Jane, Tenzin, and Lauren. And I look forward to hearing your feedback on what they have to share today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eileen. As Eileen mentioned, this year's theme for International Women's Day is Embrace Equity. And today we're gonna to talk with three uh, women leaders who do just that. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction because I'm going to ask each of them to um, talk a little bit about themselves and their work in their own words. Um, but to introduce you to Tenzin Koizen, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, Tenzin. <laughs> She is a member of the Tibetan Parliament in Exile and the Executive Director of the Active Nonviolence Education Center, which is based in India. Uh, it's an organization that aims to strengthen the foundation of active nonviolence as a tool to restore human dignity and justice for Tibet and other oppressed communities. Jane Kiyungi is the Director of Women Challenged to Challenge in Nairobi, Kenya. It's a national organization with the goal of bringing together women with disabilities to champion issues that limit their participation in development spheres. Both Tenzin and Jane are graduates of the Global Change Leaders Program, and they actually participated in the same cohort, so hopefully they have some stories to share maybe of working with each other. And uh, Lauren Sobat is the founder and program coordinator of Proud Pairs. It's an organization that strives to provide 2S LGBTQ plus youth in Halifax, Canada with social support and increase their confidence with navigating life as 2S LGBTQ plus by pairing them with a supportive adult who has been through similar experiences. And Lauren is a graduate of the uh, Pathy Foundation Fellowship um, in the most recent cohort, and I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit about how her uh, initiative came to be. Um, Tenzin, I'll start with you. Um, I know I gave a very brief introduction, but tell us a little bit more about you and your work. Um, you know, what is your focus? Who are the uh, people, partners, communities that you work with and some of the activities that you, uh, you undertake? Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. <clears throat> thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, uh, to be honest, it feels like a complete circle. You know, I've worked really hard to come to Cody since 2017, you know, to be educated at Cody last year, and then coming back to my community and giving it back um, with all the learned knowledge. Uh, it feels like, you know, a complete circle and uh, it's full of positivity. So thank you so much once again. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tenzin Shunzi. And I'm a third generation um, Tibetan, well, exiled Tibetan woman based in Dharamshala, uh, which is particularly in the northern part of India. So my people, uh, our people, had to, uh, were forced to flee Tibet uh, on the 10th of March, 1959, uh, when the Chinese Communist Party occupied Tibet um, with their military expansion. So along with His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, uh, approximately 80,000 Tibetans were forced to flee and seek refuge in India, which has now become our second home uh, and is a home away from home for us. And that's where I'm based right now. And that's where His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama lives. So I am uh, the youngest member of Tibetan parliament in exile. And I'm also the executive director for Active Nonviolence Education Center. So in, in both these roles, um, our primary or the, our priority is to focus on uh, working for uh, freedom uh, in Tibet, working uh, for the Tibetan people's movement. But, uh, you know, without taking much time, a strong realization after I took part in the Kodi educational discourse uh, was to also focus on other oppressed community. As we speak of oppression inside Tibet, we have realized it's important to um, address uh, other forms of oppression that is taking place in our own social, uh, in our own society. So we work with a lot of youth uh, and as a, an elected representative, I uh, work to represent Tibetan youth and um, 
we mostly work to uh, uh, to amend policies and we work to seek support from the international community. So we work with a lot of world leaders, with a lot of parliamentary members. And um, uh, at the grassroots, we work with kids um, to promote peace and nonviolence and uh, tool it as uh, our uh, weapon to uh, fight for justice inside Tibet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tenzin, uh, for that great introduction and uh, look forward to learning more as we go through uh, this morning. Um, Jane, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, your work with uh, Women Challenged. <laughs> Women Challenged to Challenge. It's a bit of a tongue twister for me, uh, but I love the uh, cleverness of the name. Tell us a bit more about um, who you work with, what your goals are, and uh, some of the activities that you do in your work. So thank you, Jenny, and uh, the Kodi family for having us here. So my name is Jen Kihungi. Uh, I'm from Kenya and Nairobi, the capital city. Uh, I work with women with disabilities. That is the, what the organization is there for, to bring women with disabilities together in Kenya to be able to address issues that uh, affect their participation or really limit their participation on equal basis with other people. And why is that? Is because uh, disability is perceived differently all over the world. And in Kenya, we are more as not visible. And especially when you are a woman and uh, a woman with a disability, you are not visible. And there are so many opportunities that we miss out, uh, like education, employment, participation, all that. And so that's how we came up together to be able to create awareness around disability, demystify the myths around disability and clear um, that uh, we need the same opportunity. And I'm happy because we are talking about uh, equity. So when we are saying that we are looking for equality, like gender equality for, those with the disabilities, they'll still have another level to address, and that is now the level of disability and, uh, and equity and equality. So as we progress, I'll be able maybe to explain further what equity means to a woman with a disability and uh, when you're living in Kenya and in Africa. So thank you. In brief, that's who I, I will also mention that I've been to Kodi. I'm a beneficiary twice. I was there 2010 for diploma, which I also learned a lot as a community leader. And uh, it helped me now to strength, to increase my knowledge on community leadership. And uh, recently, last year, together with Tizen, we are on the Global Feminist uh, Leaders. And uh, that also helped me to understand that when you say you are feminist, you're not talking only from the gender perspective you are looking at other people who are more oppressed and you want to bring people together so that now you, you speak from one level. And so when I came back home, I've been able to use the, the knowledge to be able to, to bring together women and men to create a feminist movement where everybody speaks of the same. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, Lauren, I'm going to move to you for you to tell us a little bit more about you and about uh, Proud Pairs. Um, you know, who are the uh, community members that you work with, the partners, and maybe tell us a little bit about how Proud Pairs came to be, because I know it's a, it's a really great story. Sure. Thanks so much, Jenny. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Sobot, and I graduated from St. FX in 2021 from my BSc. Uh, and I completed the Pathy Foundation Fellowship at Cody. Um, and this was a, a one year grant and support opportunity to start my own community projects along with a cohort of 12 others. Uh, and my project was Proud Pairs. So Proud Pairs is a mentorship program for 2S LGBTQ plus youth in Chibuktu or Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, and the goal of our program is to match youth, and we define youth as ages 15 to 23, uh, and we match them one-on-one -on -one with an adult who is 24 and up. Uh, and through this mentoring relationship, they are uh, free to get advice, ask questions, learn about navigating life as a 2SLGBTQ 
plus person. So this could be questions about how do I come out to my family? Um, I'm experiencing some bullying, and discrimination at school. How do I navigate uh, social or medical transition for trans and non-binary youth? Um, so overall, we're just aiming to give more social support, um, community connectedness and comfortability in uh, their identity for queer and trans youth. Um, so how Proud Pairs got started is uh, I was a, a queer youth uh, and um, I had some difficult experiences um, coming out to my parents uh, and navigating my teenage and young adult years uh, as a gay woman. Uh, and I was really lucky to have my own queer mentors at St. FX, two of my professors who took me under their wing. Um, and they served as really positive representation for what a happy queer future could look like. So I wanted to pay it forward and give the opportunity to have a mentor to other queer youth. Um, and currently, so our partners, Pathy Foundation Fellowship allowed us to get off the ground. Um, and for our second year, we're in our second year of operation, we've partnered with Engage Nova Scotia um, to keep the program going. So we're heading into our second cohort of mentors and mentees. Very exciting times. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And Diane in the chat says, Lauren, I love your sharing your own personal story here. And, and I love that too. And I know that each of you have um, lived experience in uh, uh, as a member of the communities that you're you're working with and, and some of the uh, focus areas. And I think uh, that's so poignant to, um, you know, be able to draw not just from wanting to help, but actually living the experience of, of those that you're working with. And um, Lawrence, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you. We'll change it up a little bit. And, um, you know, in your, uh, in your work or in your personal um, sphere, you know, what does equity mean to you? What would an equitable society um, in your perspective look like? For sure. So to me, equity means providing the appropriate level of resources and supports um, to help people achieve the same or similar goals or outcomes. And these outcomes usually look like helping people to succeed and thrive. Um, and in my opinion, this, this, dif this differs from equality, where equality is giving everyone the same opportunities or the same resources. Um, with equity, you are giving different amounts of supports to different people to meet them where they're at. So uh, in my context, and I'm, I'm speaking in a Canadian context today, it's just what I know best. Uh, and I acknowledge that around the world, to us LGBTQ plus rights, freedoms, social acceptance varies so vastly. So speaking about Canada today, um, in Canada, gender, sex, sexual orientation are protected characteristics that can't be discriminated against by law. Um, marriage equality has been achieved in Canada since 2005. Overall, Canada, um, I believe, is looked at as a world leader in equality for queer and trans individuals. Um, but at the same time, Mental health rates are uh, significantly decreased in both youth and adult to uh, us LGBTQ plus populations. Substance abuse rates are higher, uh, rates of unemployment, discrimination in the workplace, homelessness, discrimination in housing are, uh, are higher, uh, and even the existence of trans people and their access to healthcare are constantly being put up for debate. So uh, in general, even though Canada might be seen as a leader in equality, we still definitely have issues with equity. Um, and even speaking from a personal standpoint, Canada, again, is the safest country in the world, one of the safest countries in the world uh, to, be, to be gay. But I still think twice when I walk down the street holding my partner's hand, even in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So um, I think we need community supports, resources, programs, as well as social change to target the uh, both very overt uh, and covert and residual effects of homophobia and transphobia in society. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, just because there have been maybe um, laws or regulations um, passed doesn't mean that uh, that people don't behave opposing to, to those rights, that discrimination um, 
even though, for example, discrimination in the workplace based on gender, um, sex or sexual orientation may be illegal, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, and and uh, I mean, I think that's clear in a lot of the examples that you gave. Um, Jane, I'll ask you what in your context personally or with your work, um, what would equity look like to you? Uh, what would an equitable society look like? Uh, I'm also from the same background with Launa when uh, we talk about equality and equity, because for me, equity is far from equality. When you want to treat people equally, you have to think beyond that. And there's, there's so many other things that uh, needs to be done. And when I'm talking from the disability context, uh, for, for a woman with a disability to be able to participate equally, the, the, we need to put some, something in place. We need to change our attitude towards disability. We need to look at the intersectionality of every diversity because it comes with that. And um, for us to be able now to, to, to say we are on a one level playing ground, then what is it that needs to be done when for everybody to feel that they are equal, they are, they are participating equally. So for me, disability will mean uh, you need to clear our mind towards disability. How do we perceive those with disability? How do we, do we interact with them? We need to put some measures in place. Like uh, in Kenya, when you're talking about representation, Everybody is given an equal opportunity because you have a right to be voted, you have a right to vote. So we can, we can say the, the constitution provides that and it treats you equally. But then is it the same, are we going to be the same level ground with a person without disability or a woman without disability? No, why? Because the society somehow have come to accept women can be good leaders and so they can be voted. But when it comes now, you have a disability, people will see that disability before they see you. And so there, there, there are so many barriers along the way that you need to deal with, other than discrimination, other than attitude. There, there is also issues of access. How am I able to access all the buildings? If I am employed, how am I able to enter that building? Is it uh, friendly to the, to the user? When it comes to health, uh, services, am I able also to access services other than the attitude of the health workers? Are the building also friendly, the equipment, the education, is it really, am I able to go to the nearby school or do I need to go to a, a special school? Because in Kenya we have that system where we have uh, regular schools and special schools. So for me, I see barriers that we need to deal with before we speak about equity, uh, because I'm given the ground, here it is. And I want to give an example. Uh, when I was uh, admitted at CODI last year with the TZN, for me to be able to participate at the same level with her, CODI needed to put some measures in place, okay? In terms of accommodation, in terms of my, of my mobility, they have, that, that, that really needed to, need, need, needed to be taken care of. So that's why I'm saying that uh, we need to look beyond equality, like uh, issues of intersectionality. And to my context is that when culture intersects with the disability, the, the, it's never the same for, for those with the disabilities here. So uh, we have to address the barriers before we talk of equality. That's what it means to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's so um, complex because you talk about, you know, some very tangible things like making sure that, you know, a building can be accessed, you know, physically by everyone. But then there's also like the attitudes and the perceptions of what happens when you get in the building to obtain a service and the worker, um, you know, has a um, a perception of you just because you access the building doesn't mean you access the service. Um, equitably and I think that's really um, uh, difficult to to um, address and to change people's 
thoughts and their and their perceptions and we'll get to uh, maybe some strategies on on what you're doing to to try to to change that in the next question um tenzin uh i'll pass it over to you and ask the same and um you know your context is is very unique because you're you're working um not exclusively but largely with um a population who's been exiled including yourself um from your community so to talk about or, or at least the geo geographical community um there's lots of things that make up a community of course um so you know in your context to talk about um what equity would look like um what would that look like for you um well i uh, share most of the opinions both Lauren and uh, Jane has shared. Um, um, I, I agree very much with um, the points that you've shared. Um, to begin with, uh, speaking about equity, you know, um, I'm going to be really honest. Uh, before coming to 4D, I, I did have a vague understanding and a surface knowledge of what uh, of the difference between equality and equity. But um, you know, after coming to Cody, I think after having met Jane, after having learned a lot from her, a great deal of learning from her, you know, I've learned some uh, you know, some of the most interesting things from her through her presentations, through the tools that she's shared. And I'm so happy to share that uh, the moment I came back, the first thing that I did was uh, in my office was um, do the, uh, the, 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 the refresher activity that you did in our class. Uh, I hope you remember that, and it was so interesting. Also, it was in a very small-sized group, but it helped us, you know, uh, introspect on the way we uh, treat people in our society, on how we marginalize people, and the way we have been developing and designing projects uh, by marginalizing certain groups of people. Now, uh, to speak of my context, people in my community, um, there are, uh, you know, it's a large spectrum of things, a large spectrum of, you know, intersectionality factors and stuff like that. Uh, but of my recent realization, um, um, I think uh, as a youth, um, we do have um, school dropouts, college dropouts, and uh, youth who are underemployed who are usually at the edge of the, you know, usually at the margin of our society whose um, opportunities are not often talked about um, because we are more focused on the acad people following the academic lines. So uh, in terms of employment, in terms of livelihood, we have often you know, uh, uh, kept them on the sideline of our society, even when it's about policy making. So that's one thing uh, in our community because we have about 60% of unemployed youth out of which uh, 20 percent are like seasonal uh, seasonally employed and 20 percent would be completely unemployed uh, and 20 percent would be underemployed so it's a big number for a community and as someone who's interested in community development i think it's a huge um, you know uh, lack or blind spot uh, in an exiled community trying for freedom inside tibet but we don't have an active youth in here so that's one thing uh, but um, uh, in September, uh, when we had our second uh, parliamentary session, I uh, had the opportunity to take part in a debate a discussion uh, in the parliamentary session. And you know, all I could think of about uh, was about uh, Jane's, uh, you know, uh, wisdomful talking to me in those informal hours that we had shared. You know, and I was able to make out when uh, usually we'd have this parliamentary session, uh, two uh, bi-yearly parliamentary session. First would be for budget. So second would be for a report writing when they have executed or they've implemented their projects. But interestingly, I've never, you know, prior to that, I thought I was working for women. I was working for women's rights. I was working for youth empowerment. But I've never looked at it from that lens. But after coming back, I think I've understood it's important, like our facilitator would always tell us, that it's important to look from the eyes of the most dispossessed as you speak of an equitable society. So I was able to speak when uh, when it came to the uh, report session for women's rights, I was able to speak for the resource allocation for the uh, person with disabilities and uh, more importantly in our community as we speak of, uh, you know, ours is a representative democracy. So we'd be elected um, in our constituents uh, and we do have uh, seats allocated for women. 
But now I've come to realize that we have left the Tibetan nun for in the history of Tibetan, uh, you know, uh, uh, political history or Tibetan in exile, we have never seen a nun's representative in the parliament. Uh, these are uh, things we have never thought about in our processes as policymakers or as an activist or as a social activist. So these, I think, are very important. And uh, uh, and uh, of my recent realization, I think I've uh, I've come to. Uh, talk more often on these issues such as youth employment. Uh, when we speak of youth employment, we have to take in consideration uh, those who are at the margin, especially the school dropouts, uh, especially those who are in the vocational training, those who have been marginalized for a long period of time. And then to speak of person with disability, I mean, um, if you look at the Central Tibetan Administration, the constructions, uh, the buildings, you know, it's never accessible for person with disabilities. You know, I've often, you know, in, in uh, uh, when we have our teas during the parliamentary sessions, I would often talk to some of our parliament members and say, you know, uh, imagine, I mean, if one of us tomorrow will have to go on a wheelchair, I don't, I can't imagine how we'd be able to even come into the hall. So these are very, um, might look like very minute, but a very, very critical and important aspect of an equitable society, I believe. And, uh, uh, and it's not, uh, going to happen just overnight. I I believe um, it's uh, like negotiating space. Uh, as our co a facilitator would always say, it's one step forward and two step backwards. But we must understand it's important to change the mentality of people, to change the attitude of people, and it all happens in here. And it's about uh, spreading the awareness to people. I believe. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting perspective, Tenzin. And I'll I'll go to you. So you can continue your thought with the next question, which is about um, so you've you've named, you know, some of the many um, challenges about um, where inequities, you know, lie in your context. What are some of the um, strategies, some of the activities um, um, that you do to try to to make progress in those areas? Um, yeah, so um, for someone like me who is working within the community, um, and I'm really grateful for the platform that I've received through um, Active Non-Violent Education Center because I'm now, I'm not just a member of parliament who just visits the parliament two times a year, but I'm now able to meet and uh, meet with a lot of community leaders, meet with a lot of community people through the education programs that we lead. But like I said in my introduction, uh, initially, um, our aim and, aim and objective was to just try for Tibetan people's movement through nonviolence. But after coming to Kodi, I've revised the aim and objective and added uh, to also uh, support other oppressed communities. That's um, an added uh, perspective, an added lens of you know looking from the eyes of the most dispossessed. So the first thing that we did was um, to dis decentralize our power. So uh, in the office, they, we used to have this. I've used a lot of uh, tools and techniques from uh, Kodi, some of the concepts, some of the beautiful you know, uh, tools uh, that I've received from Kodi. The first thing that I did after coming back from Kodi, I mean, Kodi has kept me very busy for the last six, seven months. I've been, uh, if it weren't for Tibetan New Year, I would still be working and moving ahead. But um, I've taken a good rest as of now. But the first thing that I've done was, uh, as an executive director, I used to have a separate cabin. Um, although it was a very small space with a small size group, uh, a group of young you know, uh, Tibetan um, staff members. So what we did was I broke down the barrier of the wall because the four staff members would be uh, uh, you know, living in one small room and I'd be having a, a larger you know, room by, all by myself which I thought was also not good for our communication. So the first thing I did was just break this down, break the wall down. And then we um, just, uh, we used the ABCD approach, uh, the asset-based community development approach, uh, because we didn't have any funds. Um, but we were really positive that we want to make it happen. We didn't have to borrow any money. We didn't have to ask for any money. We didn't have to seek any funds, but we just did it with the hard work. We spent extra hours after office. We used our other assets that we had you know, in our heart, in our head, you know, uh, and we started using our skills uh, to sell some of the stuff that were like outdated, they were dysfunctional. We, we used our entrepreneurial skills to sell all of these. And then we reconstructed the entire office space and made, made it like a whole space. 
you know, legally it's uh, not possible for us to uh, not have an executive director, but what, what we have done in uh, principle is to have an uh, equal, op like equal um, power for all of us to, uh, on our decision making. So this, this is one major step for me. Uh, and thereon, as we decide for um, um, projects, upcoming projects, we have started adding a nuns leadership program. And uh, it was successfully concluded last year uh, for a group of 25 nuns, uh, uh, Tibetan nuns, who are mostly marginalized in the public domain and in uh, leadership roles. You'll never see Tibetan nuns, although they're very, uh, very much capable and very strong uh, personalities, but uh, they've never been, um, never been told that they could actually come out. Because in the parliament, we have um, a majority of monks uh, representing the monastic community, but we do not have a single Tibetan nun out there. So we are trying to focus more on that. And the challenge is that we, it's going to be really hard in a patriarchal society to kind of make people believe that um, nuns can also take part in the leadership roles. So these are like the, you know, uh, the mentalities, the attitudes of the people. So in our workshops, we're trying to incorporate all of those learned knowledge and we're slowly negotiating a space within the community through these workshops and not titling them as, you know, women's empowerment. And if we come out very loud, I believe this could scare away some of the people uh, without even understanding what it's about. But we've been successful in many other spaces uh, and we are still striving for more in the, in the coming future. Yeah, that's really insightful. And I love that, Tenzin, you're not just metaphorically breaking down walls, but you're literally breaking down walls, which is very cool. Um, and, and like you said, with the ABCD approach, you know, do it, doing what you can um, with, with what you have. Um, those are really, I think, tangible steps I can see in the chat. Lots of people are going, oh, that's a great idea. I like that. Um, I'm going to do that in, in mine. So that's fabulous. Um, Lauren, your uh, model is really interesting, and I know your organization is fairly new, um, and you're just moving into your second cohort, but, um, you know, this kind of, even though it's youth and adults, it's, it's a bit of a peer uh, mentorship in, in the sense of lived experience, they're, they're peers in many ways, and um, so how have you either in the design of the programs maybe, or even what you're seeing and what's happening organically between the mentors and the mentees, um, how are some of these equity challenges being addressed? How are you watching that happen? Right, so you're right. Our model is interesting because we're not targeting the systemic issues of, uh, of homophobia and transphobia and um, coming at it from a very, top-down approach of combating those forms of oppression in society, but we are operating from a ground level and equipping youth with the tools to um, just something as small but as powerful as being com comfortable with themselves and their own identity. Uh, and I think that you have to start with individuals. You can't uh, assemble this metaphorical army of uh, people willing to stand up for um, for queer and trans rights unless uh, they are comfortable with uh, their own queer and trans identities. So uh, our, our first step is getting youth comfortable, getting them connected to the community. Um, and through that, I'm hoping that this is down the line going to create a ripple effect of now that people are comfortable and involved in the community, um, that they will be able to contribute to these larger fights against societal homophobia and transphobia. And I've been seeing this a little bit already, even in our first cohort. Um, really a great story from one of my participants who came into the program feeling, feeling shaky in how she viewed herself, um, facing, some, uh, facing some issues with homophobia at home, uh, and through interacting with her mentor, who she described as her superhero and was so cool and felt like uh, her mentor could do anything and wanted to emulate that confidence. Um, I've seen her in her own life join, the, uh, join a leadership position at her university's Pride Society. 
I've seen her um, publicly advertise that she's open to talk in the light of um, in the in the light of a homophobic incident that it, that happened on her campus, uh, and kind of stepping into that mentor role even a year after she started talking to her own mentor. So I've been seeing it happen slowly, but uh, that that's my hope is that it's going to create this cycle of mentorship and people willing to uh, to fight this bigger fight. And personally, um, I I feel like I uh, am still learning how to fight that bigger fight. And uh, I feel like I'm engaging in my own quiet form of activism at this point in my life, whether it be um, even though I am scared at some points to hold my partner's hand when we're walking down the street, I do it anyway, as long as I am feeling safe enough. Uh, but just to give that visibility or, uh, or talking about how I do proudly identify as part of this community, um, it's those little micro moments that can add up to bigger social change. Yeah, I love that. And I love the idea of, and I know you and I have spoken um, uh, before outside of this event, but, um, you know, the, the representation as well of being able to see, you know, the future of maybe where you want to be in somebody like that representation of having, you know, a role model, or you had said once to me, you know, kind of to summarize not in your words but you know to be able to see like a representation of the life that you could live um which you didn't necessarily have an example of and i think that's so powerful um so thank you for for sharing that jane you've been so patient with us <laughs> over there um so you know you talked a lot about um again not just the uh physical or tangible you know barriers but also like the attitudes the perceptions and trying to um you know change the way that people think about um women and girls with disabilities how do you address that like what are some of the activities or strategies that you implement to try to kind of chip away at, at some of those changes uh so when we we saw that uh Advocacy would be the only way for, for us to achieve equity. We organized ourselves as women with disabilities. We got registered so that we could do an organized advocacy on those issues that I mentioned. And uh, so when we came together and we got registered, now we are able now to address uh, the issues through awareness raising at the community level. So that we are able now to dismantle those patriarchal uh, barriers and blocks that are within the society, because that's where the problem starts. So we educate the, the society about disability and uh, be able now to, to clear their, their thinking, their attitude towards that. And uh, we also talk now to, to the government about policies because when the laws and policies are not in place, then nothing much can be put in place. So when, when we realize that we have rights like any other person, but we don't really enjoy the rights, so we had to, uh, to advocate for the formulation of laws and policies. Uh, so at that level, we work now with the, with the duty bearers to be able to protect now the rights of women with disabilities. We work with the service providers where we tell them that uh, we want to access your services, but they're not accessible because of ABCD. Your building are not accessible. They are not uh, reachable. We, your people are full of attitude towards persons with disabilities. We lack communication. There is a communication barrier be between those who cannot hear and those who can hear. So we need you to learn sign language interpretation. And, uh, we, we don't talk only about awareness and uh, norms. We talk about inclusion. We want to bring the woman with a disability at the center. So how do we engage that? So we are saying that inclusion is very important when we are talking about equity, so that we are in the center, we are with everybody and the thinking is at the same level. So those are some of the strategies that uh, we have put in place. We educate women with disability themselves because again, you, you may have the rights, but again, you don't know. So we let them know that they have rights and well guided by, guarded by the constitution. And uh, we also train them how, on how to engage 
maybe to lobby for reallocation of budgets in the health sector, education, we lobby for inclusive education, so that we, we are no longer segregated in, in, uh, in schools that are segregated, but we are able to learn with other learners. And so we are saying that we don't want to participate. We want to have the meaningful participation, meaningful inclusion, that we are part and parcel of the, of the society. So, so those are some of the strategies that we have done. We encourage women to be leaders, like uh, last year, 2022, was our election year year. And so we had to train women and uh, do civic, a lot of civic education to, to be able to say, don't wait for, for leaders to come to you and tell you now we can nominate you to parliament. No, go for that seat. Try to ask people to give you votes. And uh, last year was the, one of the years that we have seen many women with disabilities coming out as candidates to be voted. Although only one was voted in one county as a, as a, a woman rep, a woman representative in that county. So she represents all the women, but she has disability. So you can see that uh, things are changing, the attitude of people are changing because for that women to, woman to be able to reach to that level where she's not only representing those with disability, but again, she's representing every woman in that county. So that's, those are some of the things we are doing. When it comes to social justice, again, we, 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 do a, we work a lot with the judiciary so that uh, when it comes to accessing justice, when something has happened to you, you have been abused, you have been violated, uh, our justice system is very complicated in Kenya. So because there are so many barriers, there are so many handles that you really have to, to go through. And so it's, it is never easy, not only for that, those with disabilities, but even for those without disabilities. So we educate them again that uh, this girl, this woman has been raped and so she needs justice. She needs to explain herself. She has the capacity. So we, again, we talk a lot, uh, a lot about legal capacity because again, when you are, when you are especially those with the psychosocial disability, they are considered not to have legal capacity, that they don't have capacity to represent themselves, to talk on their behalf. So those are some of the strategies that we have put in place. Thank you. Yeah, those are really great examples. Um, before I move on to the next question, I'm just going to remind our uh, fabulous attendees. We're getting close to the Q&A section. So if you have questions for Tenzin or Lauren or Jane, um, please put them in the Q&A section uh, if you can find it. If you have trouble finding it, sometimes it's tricky on mobile, um, throw them in the chat and we'll make sure we uh, keep an eye on that as well. Um, for this question, I'm going to open it up to whoever wants to answer it because many of you have kind of addressed this in your other answers. Um, but the, you know, the equity versus equality uh, conversation, so the, the aim of the Embrace Equity campaign for this year's uh, International Women's Day is to get the world talking about why equal opportunities aren't enough, that people start from different places and true inclusion and belonging require equitable action. Um, so I'd like to open it up to whoever uh, maybe wants to address how does, you know, the equity as opposed to equality, um, how does that show up in your work? Do you see situations where that is, um, you know, maybe people are trying to implement or, or say, well, there's already equality, but what you really need is equity. You need to go further um, and be responsive to those different starting points of, of people. Does anybody want to speak to that? I could take a stab at it. Sure, uh, Lauren. So uh, Jane and Tenzin have touched on this before, but intersectionality is a primary area of focus um, in, uh, in the field of nonprofit work and social work. Um, and in my context specifically, although we're all under this umbrella of being 2S LGBTQ, um, each letter there, so the 2S, two spirit, the L, the G, the B, the T, the Q, each of those has a very unique set of experiences and those unique set of experiences can be compounded by other factors such as race, 
um, immigration status, um, whether you are cisgender or transgender, um, maybe your faith, disability, rural versus urban. Saw Eileen in the chat was mentioning that earlier, great point. Um, and even your gender presentation, even uh, no, no matter if you're cisgender or transgender, are you, do you present more masculinely or do you present more femininely? All of these factors can intersect and really influence the way that you experience your identity or identities. Um, and how this shows up in my work with Proud Pairs is how, what people are looking for support with uh, and how I match them. So if mentees come to me and say, hey, I uh, am non-binary and would really like someone who is also non-binary. Or maybe they come to me and say, um, I uh, recently immigrated to Canada and would really like advice from a newcomer or someone who was formerly a newcomer as well. So depending on what youth's goals are and what they would like to see in a mentor, and again, it is about seeing yourself in another person, seeing your future represented in someone else, um, then I can, I, I really strive to make those specific connections happen. Yeah, that's great. I love that that's such um, a tangible example of how it shows up in the process of actually making your, your program happen. Um, anybody else want to speak to this one? Yep. Um, Jenny, Jenny, I just wanted to add, uh, yeah, add a few more from uh, what, I've just, uh, about what I've said on equity before. Um, I'm not saying I'm there, but um, definitely I've started to think about uh, some of um, the issues uh, surrounding women's, um, you know, um, accessibility in the, um, you know, uh, in the parliament or say in any kind of workspace. I've just come to realize that we do not have enough infrastructural support for women, whether it is uh, feeding their children, feeding their kids, uh, their infants or uh, whether it is for the person with disabilities, uh, you know, uh, or when it comes to period leaves, when it comes to uh, maternity leaves, we have uh, not raised enough discussions within the parliament because we, uh, we have about, out of 45 uh, member of parliaments, we have about six to seven uh, women parliamentarians. Um, therefore, I think it's, uh, I have started uh, to, um, uh, to discuss more on these period leaves, um, um, on the infrastructural accessibilities for persons with disability. In terms of equality, I think there are in equal opportunity for education, equal opportunity when it comes to employment, even on uh, 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 pays and wages, we do not have you know, unequal treatment or discrimination or disparity of any sort. But when you are pregnant, I think uh, you know um, a lot of women take a back seat, which is why we have only women in the lower rungs of the leadership and we see more men in the leadership positions as such. So these are uh, important places I'd like to work on, but I'm not saying I'm there. I'm, I'm starting to think about it. I'm starting to discuss with uh, other like-minded uh, people and uh, institutions who are working for women's rights. So these are like period, uh, period leaves, infrastructural support, uh, accessibilities, and all of these areas I think must be covered as a stake of equity. Yeah, thank you for that, Tenzin. Um, Jane, did you want to speak to this one or should we move on to the next about uh, equality versus equity? Um, are there situations that you find in your work where, um, you know, there may be the argument that, there, that this is equal, but what really is needed is an equitable approach to meet people where they're at? Yeah, I'm looking at uh, issues around resources and resource mobilization. And uh, maybe even looking at the international development partners, how do, do we treat the work around disability when it comes to funding the activities of organizations of persons with disabilities? Are they funded on uh, at the same level? Can we say that uh, they are well funded? Because the other day we were talking, we are dis discussing among us ourselves, and you're asking in Kenya, so many organizations of persons with disabilities have been formed, but how many have we seen progressing 
doing uh, a very progressive awareness and advocacy. They, they fall uh, under somewhere along the way. Why? Because of lack of funding. So is it that we don't trust that uh, the work that persons with disabilities are doing is not enough, is not bringing any change? To me, it is. And so we need to think around that even as we are mobilizing resources. How do we fund the work of uh, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities? And more so, the women who are really behind. Because if we are to talk of intersectionality and we want to understand that, that you will find a woman with disabilities is tangled at the center. You are not, you are free, but yet you are not free. And at the beginning, you talked about uh, Jane, you talked about colonization. So we could be still be, as much as Kenya is free from the colonial era, but we could still in falling in between the, the colonization by ourselves, by our attitude, by the way we think around the work of disability. And so when we fund the work of feminists or gender equality and all that, then how do we fund women with disabilities? Because you'll find most of the time we fall under the cracks, between the cracks of women rights organizations and the disability. We are not even visible there. So really, we need to think around that. And for me, so I'll speak about equality even in terms of funding and other opportunities. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we're going to move into a little bit of Q&A before we get to the last um, question that we have planned. So folks, put your uh, questions in the chat, put them in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, Jane, I think this one is for you, although Tenzin, I know with your parliamentary experience, you might have a perspective on this as well. Juliet asked, how do you deal with instances like those? So Jane, you were speaking about um, women with disabilities running um, in elections. So how do you deal with instances where somebody wasn't voted for? Juliet says, I'm asking this because a lot of people with disabilities sometimes feel rejected because they were not voted for. So how do you encourage, you know, sometimes it's a long game, right? <laughs> to, to be able to get to the point where um, somebody's in a seat or if somebody does feel rejected, maybe they don't wanna try again or other people might see that experience and go, well, it didn't work for them. So it's not gonna work for me. So how do you deal with that rejection piece um, when fighting for those seats? Uh, uh, for me, at uh, where I sit, I deal with it positively. And I say change does not happen immediately. It's not just blinking an eye and then you can say you have achieved something. It's something you have to continue trying. And uh, you might feel today you have been rejected. But again, how many people out there, even those without disabilities, have tried to be voted, to be elected, but they never own with the first attempt. They had to do it severally. And uh, I remember, our, our third president tried several times to be elected. And when he was elected 2002, he did a lot of good work. You know, people thought he might not be able to achieve. I don't know why, what we were looking for uh, out of the le our leaders. And he never gave up. He continued and he knew there's something he's going to change in Kenya. So for me, I would say, let us not give up. Let us declare that we have been rejected. No, that is not rejection. That we only attempted, you tried, keep on trying, we keep on trying and change will happen. People, we are there. We are not where we were, we were 10 years ago. People have, we have really progressed in terms of uh, uh, inclusion, in terms of people understanding disability. And I'm even happy with the She has been able to use uh, um, the, my experience with her, what we shared with her while we were in Cody. And so you can see that somebody came to Cody with an, uh, uh, an open mind. I'm going to learn from people and whatever I'm going to learn, I'm going to implement. And so Tizen uh, really learned a, quite a lot about disability. And so we can hear from her that she has really tried to do something. So it is not really a rejection. You tried, let's keep, keep on the fight. We have to move on and keep on the fire, like, I mean, on. Yeah, and I, th I think that um, 
you know, that, that was a specific example, but I'm sure that all of you and all of us deal with um, rejection in, of course, in our personal lives, but also in our work, maybe we try um, an initiative or we try to, you know, Jane, you talked a lot about advocacy, um, you know, and, and maybe you're advocating your case and, and the other party is, is you know, not uh, being receptive. Um, does anybody else want to speak to Tenzin or Lauren? You know, how do you deal with that? Um, if you want to call it rejection, because that's what it was called in the mm -hmm. question, but like Jane says, you can frame it um, differently. But how do, how do you deal with those roadblocks when, you know, if at first you don't succeed? Anybody? Um, yeah, so I'd second uh, Jane uh, in this. Um, I mean, it reminded me of one of the incidences from my own parliamentary sessions. So there's this time when uh, during the budget session, uh, when we were discussing the budget around women's empowerment, you know, uh, uh, we are run through the support of international donors. So, so the primary or the, uh, you know, the primary condition of the donors would be to include gender equality and women's empowerment projects uh, as part of the, the larger project of the Central Tibetan Administration. But um, I remember on that day, as we uh, were discussing about uh, the women's empowerment project, um, it was it just comprised of 2% of the entire budget. And uh, some of the male parliamentarians, men parliamentarians are making a fuss about it and were, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, remove um, uh, the women's empowerment project um, and, and were actually uh, opposing uh, the importance of such in our Tibetan community and were totally disregarding the fact that it's a patriarchal society. So I remember uh, standing up to it, uh, I was alone. Uh, my voice was shaking. My, I was literally uh, crying, you know, I broke down. Uh, and uh, I uh, kind of shared my heart out and said it's such a shameful for our platform like this and and uh, various you know uh, speaking as a representative of the Tibetan uh, people and we are neglecting a large section of it uh, Tibetan youth Tibetan women who are actually suffering under you know gender based violence uh, so I was speaking uh, against some of the more powerful you know parliamentarians in the house uh, and I I believe that was my first. Um, a session I took oath just last year. Um, uh, I, I believe I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the last um, person to uh, take oath in the office. So um, that's how it happened. And I couldn't sleep for a few uh, nights. Uh, I actually felt, because when you think in a, in a house where the majority uh, is against you, you start to feel like maybe I've gone somewhere wrong. Maybe they were right. It, it hits you on your face. And uh, you, it's not always hunky-dory like they say. but over the period of time, I realized that that was one of the best hits that I've given in the uh, in the parliament sessions, and uh, I've spoken the truth. Not always will you be, you know, surrounded by applauders, the people who laud your uh, achievements, but uh, you know, uh, when people are trying to, uh, you know, um, challenge you, that you you somewhere is going towards justice, somewhere going towards truth, and that always win. I mean, I'm I'm proudest of uh, uh, most of my addresses in the parliament. I'm proudest of that day. When I uh, literally cried, uh, when when my voice shook, but shook, uh, but I spoke for justice. So so it's like you know, one step forward, two step backwards, but you keep moving forward and keep negotiating space here and there. Right? Yeah, that's a really powerful example, Tenzin. Thank you, and and about you know pushing through the emotion, but also acknowledging like we we are emotional human beings, and that that piece of you know, vulnerability and, you know, the way we process challenges, successes, everything in between um, is, is uh, you know, part of our, our experience as well. Um, Lauren, how about you? How, how do you manage, um, you know, rejection? Like, you know, I, uh, in your personal journey, in your work journey with your organization, maybe in previous iterations, you know, you come up with this, super fabulous idea and it's brand new and you're trying to convince people that it's a great idea maybe not everybody is convinced um or in other areas like what's your approach to that yeah i um i remember early on in the uh in, in my proud pairs journey um i i had a meeting with someone doing similar community work uh, running a mentorship program. And uh, in this meeting, I was sharing my my big ideas, my hopes, my dreams. 
Um, and, and I was met with questions like, okay, where's your liability insurance? Um, where are your very robust written down um, policies for if something goes wrong, how about, uh, what about transportation? Where are your procedures around uh, safe meetups, things like that, that I hadn't yet figured out. And I, um, I hadn't even thought of some things like the liability insurance at 21. I was like, what is that? So um, I definitely ran into some challenges early on with just wrapping my head around um, running an organization um, that were very humbling. Uh, I, I won't lie and say that after that call, it was, uh, it was an easy time getting back on the horse and believing in myself that I could do this. But um, I guess I, I really just leaned on my support systems, whether it be my uh, own mentors, um, my family and friends, my cohort uh, from the Pathy Fellowship. Um, so I've been really lucky to have a really strong network of support and to people facing similar challenges or maybe even uh, rejections of those ideas. Um, I would recommend building a very, uh, very strong system of support and leaning on those people and on those relationships as much as you can. Yeah, that's fabulous. I love that mentorship plays such a strong role, not just in what your program actually is, but how you approach um, all of the different facets of it, including your own experience as a founder of, of the organization. Um, even founders can use mentors. We all need uh, somebody to bounce ideas off of, and uh, it can all, all often be a very um, lonely journey or, or kind of silo journey when you're, when you're trying to start something new. Um, we have a couple of questions here. One more just came in. Um, so Bernadette from Burundi says she has a couple of questions, but some of them have kind of been answered in, in various forms. So I'm going to pare it down a little bit here. Um, but she's talking about Jane, you speaking about um, people with disabilities being represented in parliament and increasing accessibility. Um, she says, uh, how do we come up with strategies uh, for the government, I guess, to convince the government um, to make changes for access for people with disabilities? So whether it's physical form of access, making sure buildings are accessible and that the experience being there is accessible, but also the accessibility of, um, you know, ensuring that there are seats and representation. How do we how do we advocate with governments? <laughs> Um, who seem so daunting and like such big um, players in the games when it comes to accessibility. How do you approach that? Uh, for me, I would say it's uh, about engaging and engaging. We need to continue engaging the government, the actors, so that uh, things are put in place and uh, they have to give orders, you know, through the laws that when, uh, for instance, Kenya, assigned and ratified CRPD, this Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And also in our constitution, they have tried to, to, to put that, that I have a right to be everywhere any other person is. But is that the case? So we need to enforce the law. We need to advocate for the government to be able to enforce the law because the law is there, the policies are there, but the, it, the implementation of those laws in Kenya is the problem because it's very low. So, but how do we, then enforce that is through advocacy, through advocacy. So, and women challenge to challenge, we are engaging the government quite a lot. And tomorrow, 8th, uh, when it is International Day for Women, we are having a meeting and we expect government people to be there in that meeting. And these are some of the things you'll be speaking to. Yeah, great. I, I want to thank everybody for putting in their questions and for uh, Tenzin, Lauren, and Jane for being so uh, open to receiving those questions. Um, we don't have time for any more questions, but if you have um, things to add to the chat, if you have further questions or comments, we uh, will save the chat and make sure that 
uh, Jane and Lauren and Tenzin have access to that if they'd like to see it. I know the chat goes by very fast and it's hard to follow it when you're speaking. So we'll make sure that you guys get all those wonderful notes that uh, people are saying about your uh, contributions today. And uh, a great segue, as Jane just mentioned, tomorrow is International Women's Day. But around here, we like to spread it out for a whole week. Uh, so today's event is part of a week-long agenda of online and in-person events organized by community organizations, businesses, individuals here in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I want to give a very special thank you to the Antigonish Women's Resource Centre for their initiative in co-organizing and kind of compiling many of these fabulous events and uh, encouraging us all to participate. Thanks to Eileen, um, who you heard from earlier, Brian, who's behind the scenes on the technology, and all of our Cody colleagues behind the scene. Thank you to each of you who are here today. And of course, a very, very special thank you to our panelists. And I'm going to ask you one closing question um, to kind of close us off on a good, um, positive note. Uh, I know we talk a lot about challenges, um, and sometimes it can be, um, it, it, it can feel heavy. There can be a lot to, to kind of process in all of the things that are not working and the ways that we want to um, try to improve those. But let's talk about our everyday experience. Everybody on this call, there may be other people working in organizations, people may not be. We may have um, uh, students and uh, community members and people in business and social organizations. And we have people all around the world um, here in this call, what is one thing that you think we can do in our everyday lives that helps improve equity? Let's start with uh, Tenzin. Um, so before I um, close down for today, I uh, just wanted to wish each and every strong woman out there a very happy International Women's uh, Week. Um, and I hope you flourish in whatever work that you're doing. Um, uh, so about what you can do, I think, um, you know, however much changes we see in the materialistic world, you know, uh, how it might come out as very preachy because I've become so used to it with my training sessions, but I'd like to, you know, keep it as not preachy as possible. But uh, what I believe in, some values that I've imbibed from, from my uh, religion, Buddhism, and from, uh, my educational support from Cody, from my wonderful you know, women leaders who uh, you know, support my journey. I, I think you know, before we actually start out on fixing others, um, as we speak of equity and all, uh, it's important to also realize that it has to come from here and here. So it's the mind and the heart that you have to actually uh, start cleansing out as we judge others, judge people's choices, judge people's abilities. So uh, I think it should begin with you, uh, so to speak. Uh, if you're going to make a change, if you're going to speak about power decentralization, it should, it should start from you. You should learn to share your power with people and you should do it in practice. So in Buddhism, we say all our actions are driven by our intention. So it's our heart and mind that decide. So it's important to fix ourselves first and not be too focused on fixing others in the process of change making initiatives. So it should just begin with you, I think. And it's the simplest process, self, uh, self introspection uh, and, um, you know, learning to have a good heart, but not a savior mentality, so to say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love that. We're all on our own personal journeys and uh, and we have to go through that uh, ourselves. Um, Jane, how about you? What's something we can do in our everyday lives that uh, improves equity around us? Uh, Tizen is like, you read my mind because uh, that's what I wanted to say, that uh, we don't have to wait for other people to change. The change has to start with us, me, and if I change my attitude towards other people, that is, then I'll be letting them come and occupy the same space that I'm occupying. That, that, that friendly and uh, accessible spaces uh, that where, where everybody needs and um, feels comfortable, that's where we should be. And we talk about feminists. What do we say? What do we mean by creating a, a, a feminist movement? Is where everybody understands. We, we are addressing the issues of oppression. We are uh, uh, from all angles. We don't say that uh, 
you cannot be discriminated because of your color, because of your race, because of your gender. By all aspects of life, we should not discriminate anybody. So for me, let's change and the change starts with me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jane. And Lauren, uh, how about you? What's something that we can do in our everyday lives? You can email me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Uh, it's info at proudpairs.com. Um, but if you have any questions about um, the 2SLGBTQ plus community, about mentorship, about um, community leadership, uh, I would love nothing more for than you to reach out. Um, usually my go-to answer for improving uh, equity, just everyday actions is um, listen to marginalized voices, try to empathize and put yourself in the shoes of others, which is um, incredibly uh, valid and helpful. But today I want to take it one step further and um, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions. Nothing is too silly and I'll outsource if I don't have the lived experience to answer your question. But um, yeah, love, would love to hear from you. I love that. And that's a great note um, to end on about, uh, you know, leaning on each other. We have uh, Tenzin and Lauren and Jane are, are part of a fabulous community of, of Cody graduates. And I know that many of you um, lead on each other in your work and your personal lives. And uh, I'm just very, very grateful that you were all here to share your uh, experiences with us today. So a very big thank you and uh, happy International Women's Week, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Susan, happy to see you. Happy to see you too, Jane. Yeah, I will, Thanks, I will everyone. Watch Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, do that. Great okay. to meet everyone. Lots of love. Uh, yeah.